You're listening to Hardscape Growth, a podcast for hungry professionals who want to grow their businesses and level up. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Hardscape Growth Show. I'm your host, Alex from Tackle Block, and today we're joined by Sarah Linneman from The Green Executive. Green Executive is a consulting firm for the green industry, uh, and their goal is to help contractors manage their cash flow more effectively and be more profitable. Is that uh, a fair statement? Yeah, I think that sums it up. Thank you, Alex, for having me here. I am excited to dig in and to um, reach your audience and talk shop a little bit. All right, awesome. So we met um, about a month, a month and a half ago at uh, an event in Orlando, and uh, we got to talking, and one of the things that you uh, mentioned was how you guys do this consulting. And and one of the, the core principles is profit first. And I see there's a book on the shelf behind you and there's a bag on the desk behind you and both of them say profit first. So what is that concept and how does it apply to people in our industry? It's it's very literal. So it's it's literally taking your profit first. So as a business owner, you're you're taking on risk and mm-hmm. there should be some reward to that risk. And that profit can be your reward. What happens a lot of times is that it becomes an afterthought. It becomes almost like a bonus if there's any profit left at the end of the day. But we want to flip that. We want to flip that and literally take the profit out of that income first and then operate with what's remaining instead of the the business getting all the eating up all that money that's coming in. We want you and to, then hoping there's to something get, left. Right. Hopefully uh, we're going to yeah. remove the hope part and make sure. OK. All right. So how how do we do that? So it. Yeah. I said it's profit first, literally, and it, it yeah. truly is that. So okay. what, what you do mechanically is all the money that comes into the business, it goes into what we call an income account. And so you're feeding that income account. And then when you start out, you go once a week and you sweep it and you pull out everything but what you have to have in there because we don't want to get any bank fees for going under our minimum or anything like that. But you sweep it and then you distribute that income into – your core accounts, your core being profit first. So your profit account, then owner's pay, which is your um, reward for contributing to the company. So it's your compensation for contributing to the company. Truly your pay for the work you perform for the business versus that profit is your reward for the risk. And then taxes, we got to earmark for those. Mm-hmm. Got to make sure that's taken care of. And then we operate under what's left. So whatever's left is what we can use to run payroll, pay our bills, keep the lights on, all of that. So um, basically, I have five accounts running my business. I have a That's true. Prof- I have a, a, an income account. Then that gets swept and branches off into profit account, mm-hmm. owner's pay account, taxes account, and an operations account. Exactly. Which includes payroll, includes uh, all my overhead recovery, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the core accounts. Now, every okay. business is different, right? So you might say to me, but Sarah, I really want to pay down debt or I have a plan that I want to buy some property or I want to start an equipment fund or I, I don't know if I can support a new hire. So those are all accounts. When in debt, doubt, add an account. So those are all accounts that you can start shuttling money into. And then if, if it's comfortable to support that account, then you know you can support that new employee. Then you know you can go ahead and make that equipment purchase and handle the monthly bill that it's going to be. So there's, there's lots of things you can do once you have the core under your belt, then you can really customize it. And that's the point. Every business is different. So we really want to make sure that you're running it how best suits you. Okay. So why is that the, um, the approach that you've adopted and that you used to coach and consult with? Well, we didn't, we didn't always practice profit first, for sure. Okay. So our story is my, my husband started a lawn mowing business when he was a kid, mowing lawns in the neighborhood. And when I met him, he already had that business established. And it's, it's pretty common to hear me say that. I, I feel like I brought along the processes and procedures, you know, like he had the business established and he had the physical know-how and the clients and all that. And I brought along the paperwork component, the not so fun, the not so shiny fun things, Mm -hmm. but all important things too. And there were honestly a lot of years where we didn't get profit out of the business and times we didn't get paychecks. And, 
you know, there were tight times running to the mailbox was pretty common, getting the mail every single day, hoping there was enough money in there to send off whatever vendor payment I needed to that day. Mm. So, you know, we've been there, we've done that. And over the course of time, got a little smarter, got a lot wiser and started really shifting our focus as a company on the services that we offered. And, you know, we met in Orlando at an Element event. Element really did help us, um, see where we were profitable as a company and help us focus on that. And in fact, we don't mow anymore because for us, it just wasn't a leader and um, it, it didn't make the cut long term. So it, it helped us shift, huh? That's a good pun. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, I feel like the universe really, it sounds really cheesy, but I do feel like the universe pointed us in the direction of profit first. So we were, we were practicing with LMN and then we just kept seeing profit first here and there and people started talking to us about it. And, and there were enough signs that we finally listened to them and went all in with it in our own businesses, practicing profit first and, you know, doing that income account and sweeping it and making sure money was earmarked where it needed to go to. And, and truly operating under what was left. And then we um, went through the, the the ropes of being able to share that with others. So what it's done for us is, I, I really feel like LMN is the plan. So when we sit down and we work in our software and we do our budget and we do our plan and we do all these estimates, you know, we're planning for the money to go certain places. And then Profit First is taking the cash and acting on it. Truly earmarking that cash for what it was intended to be earmarked for and, and being able to have comfort in knowing that when my tax bill comes, that's tens of thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. I've got the money for it. The, yeah. There's great reassurance in that. Now on a daily basis, my husband, Adam might disagree with you and say that, uh, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable operating my company under, you know, much less money than in theory I had in my bank before. Okay. But, yeah, but that's the you point. You have it, but it's spoken for, so you exactly. don't really. So when you're going in and you're looking at your bank account balance, sometimes it makes you really nervous because there's not as much money in there as you're used to looking at because you've swept it. It's already gone mm -hmm. all these other places. But, but that's just, just that much more of an indication of how it's really important to price things properly because oh. it always looks like more until everything's paid for. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. That's the sad news is where'd all my money go? Or you're at the end of the year or the month and you're looking at your profit and loss and you're saying, oh, great. Where's all this money that it says that I have? Well, you, well, you don't have it because mm -hmm. it was already shuttled away to things over on the balance sheet or you had to pay your taxes or you had to, you know, it's, it's just gone. It's not there at the end of the day. Well, let's get proactive about it and make sure it is there at the start of the day. This episode is brought to you by EZG. Since 1998, EZG has been crafting equipment solutions to solve issues contractors face daily from their shop in Malta, Ohio. Every piece of American-made equipment is designed to increase efficiency and cost savings on each and every job site. A couple tools you need in your trailer right now. The Crack Hog Precision Splitter. It's the original dustless cutting tool. It's safe, it's quiet, and it's perfect for pavers, slabs, and wall block. And if you're planning on laying a lot of large-scale slabs this year, the Grip Hog lifters battery compressor or vacuum powered will boost safety and efficiency finally the ezg roller paver compactor will consolidate joint fill without breaking the slabs and plank stones on your next project and their customer service is honestly unparalleled each product comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee if you're not a hundred percent satisfied they'll take it back no questions asked visit ezgmfg.com to learn more about their awesome line of tools and equipment so one of the things that you said uh, earlier in that in the telling of the story was you said it, it's it seems pretty common w what were you referring to that when you were saying it, was, it seems pretty common but when you said you got involved and and basically took over the the processes or brought the processes oh. and the not the not fun stuff what, the not what's fun common stuff. oh i guess so that's a good question <laughs> <laughs> and i would say what's what's common is the paperwork and that, that kind of office stuff gets yeah. set to the side. Um, yeah. It's the shoebox of shame. You know, everyone's got their <laughs> shoebox of shame that they bring out when it's tax time. And then it's like, oh, shoot, I've got to deal with this stuff now. And then they suck it up or they hand it over to their accountant or a bookkeeper and say, deal with this. And then they find themselves in the same situation next year. 
mm-hmm. then they get their taxes done and their accountant's like, well, you made this much money. And they're like, really? Because I don't have this much money. Where did it all go? Or now I have a big tax bill. I mean, hopefully they say, you know, paying taxes is a good thing. It's a sign that you made money. Well, it doesn't feel that way all the no, time. Yeah. It, it kind of hurts. But knowing that that stuff is important and giving it some love and attention can go a long way. And I mean, the goal is not just to have it ready for taxes and get out of that shoebox of shame, but to have that information available to you to use to help you make decisions on your business, to help see trends and the way things are going and, and help you make business decisions. So can we hit both of those things? I guess the first one being, how do I get out of that shoebox of shame? And then the other one is <laughs> the next steps from there. Uh, It's just getting proactive, right? It's making a conscious decision. Little decisions every day is what's going to get us there, both in profit first and out of that shoebox. So those little decisions every day include things like, hopefully you you engage a bookkeeper if you don't have someone on staff to do the books. Um, Engage someone. And you don't have to have someone on staff do it. I mean, don't limit yourself to who's next door. I mean, it's worldwide technology lets us, engage people to help us from anywhere in the world. So um, here at the Green Executive, we're based in St. Louis, but we have clients all across the country because um, we leverage technology to help us be able to help our clients get out of that shoebox of shame. And on a daily, if not daily, but weekly basis, track where their money's going. So that's what we're always doing is just letting software, usually QuickBooks, know what happened in real life. And that's all that's all bookkeeping is, is letting the the software or the system know what happened in real life and taking the time to do that. So what are what's maybe your best advice for breaking that cycle of of doing it? Like it's one thing to say, you know, take some time every day or every week to to manage the books and stay on top of the paperwork. Um, but it's another thing to actually do it consistently. So do you have any tips on helping people develop that habit and making it a discipline where mm-hmm. it is, it's just, it's like clockwork every, every week it happens. I have two. One is put okay. it on your calendar. So usually what gets scheduled happens. So make an appointment with yourself to sit down and do that. And, you know, know yourself when you make that appointment, know if you, if your brain works that way better in the morning or the afternoon. So do yourself a favor. And if, if, if that's a first thing in the morning kind of task, then schedule it for yourself for first thing in the morning. Or if it's an afternoon thing, get it down that way. Okay. And then two is you don't have to necessarily be the one to do all of it. So engage someone. So either delegate it to somebody on your team, engage a bookkeeper like the green executive. You know, there's, there's lots of ways that this can happen. And it, it, the intention is to help guide the business and to help you know where you're at and to be proactive about everything. So if you need somebody to hold you accountable and, and make this happen for you, make make a one-time decision to ask somebody to do that. Okay. I mean, it makes sense. So what would the next steps be from there then? So now I've, I've started doing that. Um, that's the, that's the hard part, right? Yeah. That's the hard part to get, to get it rolling, but then you've got momentum and you got to keep it going. Okay. So, um, we really like to push for receipt forward recording of transactions. So what I mean that by mean? that is you make a purchase and then that purchase gets recorded from the receipt compared to, Hey, I bought something from Amazon. All my Amazon stuff gets recorded as an office expense. Well, you could buy a gazillion things from Amazon. It could be materials. It could be an office expense. It could be food for the team. It could be lots of different things. So we always like for our clients to record the receipt itself. And we don't necessarily rely on the bank feed. So in in your software, in QuickBooks, there's a bank feed that comes through and says, hey, you spent so much money at, at this place and that place. We would prefer to have the receipt from this place and that place that says what we bought. What it was, yeah. Exactly. So that way we can get it really specifically into the books to say um, exactly what that purchase was tracking to. And Mm -hmm. even like 
a lot of companies are divisional, right? So even if it was a material, well, was it a material for maintenance or was it a material for hardscapes? What was it a material for? And we have industry knowledge, right? So you kind of know, but we don't want to guess. We want to guess as little as possible. And that's why we like the receipts. We do use the bank feeds to make sure we got as many, if not all of the receipts. But um, we always want to practice that receipt entry. And it could be as simple as, hey, we have an inbox for receipts that somebody's responsible for scanning into the system every now and then, ideally Mm -hmm. like once a week. Um, Or it can be, hey, I have an app on my phone and I'm scanning that receipt in every time I make a purchase. And as you're scanning it, you're you're indicating the reason for the purchase? Mm -hmm. So we have kind of an old school system that tends to work really well. It's, it's a return address stamp. So it's a stamper. I actually have one right here. Of course, of course I do. So it's a, it's a stamp. Alex can see it here. So it's literally like a return address stamp and on it are some bits of information like, Hey, who made this purchase? What was it that you bought? Because sometimes receipts are pretty like code. And then, um, who was it for? So it's also accountability. Like, was it for a particular client? meaning um, or was it for the office you know just some little pieces of information and the intent is that stamp can sit by that inbox and whoever makes the purchase they stamp it write those bits of information on it and then turn it into the office and whoever my kids actually scan the receipts for our our company business that's a good task that they can accomplish so um whoever can scan that in and then um the information's on there and then as bookkeepers, we take it from there at the green executive, but everybody has their own process. Big picture wise, the process is, hey, a purchase is made. That information needs to make its way to the books. Yeah. And there's lots of different paths that it can take. But ideally, it's the receipt going in because the receipt has all those details of exactly where your money's going. Then that happens over time. Over time, that builds a lot of integrity into your books. So when you're going to run reports of, hey, where is my money going? Then I can really clearly have confidence in what I'm seeing and know exactly where my money's been going. And then if I don't have enough cash to pay my bills out of my operating account, okay, let's look. Where's the money been going? Let's triage this and determine where we can make adjustments. This episode is brought to you by Hardscaper.com. The Hardscaper mission is to empower industry professionals with the skills, inspiration, and confidence they need to take their businesses to new heights. Struggling with training programs for your team? Looking for helpful tips to build a better company? Subscribe today to gain access to hours of interactive on-demand Hardscape construction and business courses for free. Check out Hardscaper.com. So as a part of that, then... um because once once you're you're tracking that stuff, it gives you the p- possibility to create a budget for how things should be spent. Like yes. uh, if I if I take the example of your of your uh, your Amazon, I mean I'm I'm not sure. I can't think of something off the top of my head that I would be ordering for Amazon. But let's say we're we're constantly running to Home Depot, let's say to pick up mm-hmm. some, um, I don't know, pick up some glue mm-hmm. because we're we're always short on glue because we don't stock it at our shop. Um, and we're paying a premium because we're buying it by the individual unit there where I could be buying it in bulk for my landscape supply yard if I was planning for it. And even Um, better, have it on hand so you're not taking the time to run to the store and get it. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the visibility that it can provide when you Mm -hmm. start to get into that discipline. And that I, I guess it's almost like that becomes one of the motivating factors to keep doing it because you start to see like where are the leaky buckets and you can start to patch them because now you see it. Whereas if you're just relying on what the bank statement says, it's very hard to do that. And if you're not doing that at all and you're still at the shoebox of shame part, well, then you really don't know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love that example of, you know, if we're running to Home Depot all the time, because it's very true that if as a bookkeeper, if I start seeing receipts that, multiple times a day we're going Mm -hmm. to a supply yard like that it definitely raises a flag okay why are we going there multiple times a day there's something that's that's not jiving here there's something that's not churning we need to look at the process of why is this happening are we forgetting stuff are we failing to stock it are we just not planning appropriately because that's huge to run to the supply yard once let alone multiple times a day that's very costly for a company Mm mm-hmm 
Um, okay, so that's good stuff. But um, I'm curious, because you get to interact with so many different companies um, across the country, regardless of the cash flow methodology, uh, whether they're using Profit First or not, what's one of the biggest mistakes that you see people making consistently that you wish they could wrap their head around and do something about? <laughs> so I think a lot of times it is the books, not to harp on it, but yeah, it's true well, that's okay. that... I mean, that's, that's that's what your focus is. So <laughs> I'm not overly surprised. <laughs> so, so a lot of times we, we have people come to us. Thank goodness. You know, I'm so glad that we found each other and, and we go in and we say, okay, let's see, let's get a baseline. What are we working with here? What are we talking about? And it's truly a dumpster fire sometimes that, <laughs> I mean, I'm not kidding, Alex. There's, there's times when people, you know, and sometimes unknowingly they, they think they're doing well. And I've seen people just have books that either aren't there. I've had people say, I think I have QuickBooks online subscription, but I don't know. Like, like literally they don't know because they are so distracted in the day to day, the fun, shiny in the field stuff and taking mm -hmm. care of servicing clients that that back burner is getting loaded up with all the paperwork and they don't even know. And sometimes they've engaged a quote unquote professional accounting firm that has done them a disservice. It's really disheartening how often I've seen that, that people have engaged a bookkeeper, they have engaged an accountant to provide that service for them. And it's just not happening. And they're, they're not doing it or they're way behind or they don't have access to their own books. And those are all huge red flags for me that, that the, the firm they've engaged is doing them a disservice. And I don't want to say taking advantage of them, but um, it, it kind of leans that way. So what what are the red flags then? What am I looking out for? In you want to make sure you have access to your books. So if you've engaged someone to do your books for you, and by books, I mean just bridging that gap between the daily purchases and tax filing, right? All that stuff that happens in between, tracking where your money's coming in from and going to. So um, you always want to have access to your books. Think of it, I, I was thinking about this the other day, and it's kind of like an artist. Some bookkeepers say, this is my work. So it's my work and it's not, it's not yours as the business owner where I would think of it as commissioned work because mm. you've commissioned somebody to do this work for you. And those books are yours. Just like an artist's drawing would be yours if you've commissioned mm -hmm. it. So I like to think of it that way, but you always want to make sure if you're using QuickBooks online, that you're the primary admin of the account. If your bookkeeper is doing something in a software that's like proprietary to them, then you want to make sure you can access it. These are consider them your books. It is your company's information that you've commissioned. So definitely want to have access to it. And then get familiar with those profit and loss reports if you're not already. And and start seeing if the numbers make sense. Like truly engage with what's happening there. You know, sometimes you think, hey, I've hired somebody to do this and they've got it covered. And hopefully that's the case. But at the same time, the goal is for you to use that information, right? So start using it, start getting comfortable with it. And then you'll, you should be able to see, all right, are, are numbers making sense here? Because your gut and your intuition speaks volumes when it comes to that stuff. Mm -hmm. So if I had to summarize, uh, that part of like they're your books that you're delegating the responsibility or not summarize, but like rephrase it, but you're delegating the responsibility, not the ownership of the books. Exactly. Yeah. That's, th a that's, that's important because you don't want to deal with it in the first place. That's why it's a dumpster fire. <laughs> so then you hire someone, you're like, great, I don't have to look at this, but that's a mistake because even if they're the, uh, they have the best of intentions, it doesn't mean that they're actually doing it well or doing it the way that will lead to the most success for you. And that's what they need to do. So you need to be keeping an eye on it. And it's, it's kind of the, the trust, but verify mindset. Exactly. Of like, you know, yeah. I trust they're doing a job, but every now and then I'm going to dive in. I'm going to look, I'm going to sit down with them. I have them explain mm -hmm. to me what, what I'm seeing, what they're seeing. Are we seeing the same things the same way? That's right. what Does, you mean. Cause even with the best of intentions, I could be tracking something in a way that's incorrect or not serving the company. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure. And usually when that bubbles out is when you dig into those books, like when it's LMN budgeting time, mm -hmm. that's when you're digging into the numbers and you're saying, okay, well that, that figure doesn't really make sense to me. What's building it. And then you can dig into it and say, okay, well 
something's tracking wrong or we're missing this and, oh, we need to talk about this. This this definition of, of what's a hardscape material versus a softscape material is different amongst the company or amongst the bookkeeper. So it's just making sure we're all really clear on what's building the numbers. And I always want a profit and loss statement to tell the owner or the manager what they need to know. Does this tell you what you need to know? Because over time that can change, you know, as a business grows and changes, what the books need to tell you can shift as well. So Mm -hmm. we always want to make sure it's telling you what you need to know. Okay. So as we, um, as we wrap up here, what, if you had uh, a last piece of advice or a last couple of tips, uh, really critical things, because uh, this episode will be out in a couple of days. So we're in the month of April. So it's, it's gunslinging time for everyone in the industry. We're all rocking and rolling. So what is for the sure. most important stuff that I could address right now, considering I am at peak activity level currently? A super easy thing you can do is open a profit account. You don't have to do full loan profit first. If the five accounts intimidates you or the bookkeeping intimidates you, how you can start today is open a profit account, start shimming 2% into it or even 1%. There's the 1% challenge. If you can operate your business on 100%, you can operate your business on 99 or at 98%. So start start sweeping 1% or 2% off into a separate account and watch how that builds. And then hopefully, just like you said earlier about the books, Alex, about, you know, once you start seeing some results, that kind of gives you fuel and desire to continue, start building that profit account and then watch that money build and how easy that was and then expand on it. I like it. You're basically giving yourself a little preview of what could be with just a one or 2% little, little drop in the bucket. And Next time you look up, because you're going to be, you know, head down, just grinding away for the next little bit, but you'll Absolutely. you'll pop up for a breather. You'll look like, oh, hey, there's a couple of grand in there. Yeah. I should probably look at this a bit more. Maybe <laughs> we can make a 2%. Maybe we can make a 3%. You know what? How much profit am I supposed to be making on these jobs? Is it 10%? Is it 20%? Okay, well, let's make it 20% now and, and start going from there and challenge mm-hmm. yourself to, to really optimize on the financial side, because that's ultimately that that's, that's, that's the thing that gets neglected a lot, like you said. And it's, I think a lot of it is out of lack of understanding and almost a bit of borderline fear. It's not because you don't want to, it's you don't know how. And that's why it's important, you know, to build a network, talk with people, because, you know, there are other, other business people in your shoes who have walked that path before and who, who do know. But beyond that, there's also the fact that, you know, there are people like you that can help guide me in the right direction, make the right decisions and make sure that my business is as profitable as, as it's supposed to be. Because at the end of the day, that's why I am in business is to make money. It's well, great. I, you know, we, we build great things and we do fantastic work and we transform people's lives and all that stuff. But that's great. But you can't continue to do it if the financial side is a mess. Exactly. We, the, the company that you're, you're working in or for is what's bringing us together. And we have to make decisions based on what's best for the company. And that enables us to continue the company on and do all those great things. Awesome. So if people want to reach out to you, want to learn more about uh, the green executive, uh, maybe even hire your services, what's the best way for them to contact you and take those next steps? I would love for them to connect with us. We have um, our website, thegreenexecutive.com, and we're all active on the socials. There is a Profit First for Landscapers group on Facebook um, where you can reach myself or Adam, my husband, and also all the other Profit First users that are in there too. And there's lots of topics on ways to strategize about gaining profit. Of course, the mechanics of the Profit First system itself, but that's definitely a resource in like you said, Alex, there's so many resources out there and so many free ones that, you know, like this podcast, like by all means, take advantage of them. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to join us on the show. Uh, make sure guys to check out the And if you're on Facebook, check out that profit first for landscapers, Facebook group, uh, lots of good stories on there. Like you said, lots of people who are uh, already in the program, running the program and, and some success stories. So you can pick some other people's brains and see what they have to say and get some more uh, objective feedback before you, you take the plunge if, uh, if you're hesitant to do so. But it makes a lot of sense and it's a very simple way of managing the cash flow. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's the, the key thing is it's, it's not overly complicated. It's really just create the buckets, make sure that 
the account just fills each one of those buckets with how much is supposed to go in each one every week. And uh, it's kind of an autopilot if once you have it set up properly. It, it seems too simple to work. It really yeah. does. And, and that's kind of but the beauty it of it. That's mm-hmm. it. Cool. Well, thank you very much once again. And until next time, everyone, work hard, pave harder, and we'll see you next week on the Hardscape Growth Show. Thank you. You've been listening to Hardscape Growth, a podcast for hungry professionals who want to grow their businesses and level up. Each episode is all about taking the next step in running your business. So make sure you never miss a show by subscribing on your favorite podcast player. And if you're finding this information to be useful, help others in your position discover us by giving us a star rating and leaving a comment. We'll see you next week.